This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 18. Miss Ophelia's Experiences and Opinions. Our friend Tom, in his own simple musings, often compared his more fortunate lot in the bondage into which he was cast with that of Joseph in Egypt. And, in fact, as time went on, and he developed more and more under the eye of his master, the strength of the parallel increased. St. Clair was indolent and careless of money. Hitherto the providing and marketing had been principally done by Adolf, who was, to the full, as careless and extravagant as his master. And between them both they had carried on the dispersing process with great alacrity. Accustomed for many years to regard his master's property as his own care, Tom saw, with an uneasiness he could scarcely repress, the wasteful expenditure of the establishment, and, in the quiet, indirect way which his class often acquire, would sometimes make his own suggestions. St. Clair at first employed him occasionally, but, struck with his soundness of mind and good business capacity, he confided in him more and more, till gradually all the marketing and providing for the family were entrusted to him. "'No, no, Adolf,' he said one day, as Adolf was deprecating the passing of power out of his hands. "'Let Tom alone. You only understand what you want. Tom understands cost and come to, and there may be some end to money by and by if we don't let somebody do that.' Trusted to an unlimited extent by a careless master who handed him a bill without looking at it, and pocketed the change without counting it, Tom had every facility and temptation to dishonesty, and nothing but an impregnable simplicity of nature, strengthened by Christian faith, could have kept him from it. But to that nature the very unbounded trust reposed in him was bond and seal for the most scrupulous accuracy. With Adolf the case had been different thoughtless and self-indulgent, and unrestrained by a master who found it easier to indulge than to regulate, he had fallen into an absolute confusion as to meum tuum with regard to himself and his master, which sometimes troubled even St. Clair. His own good sense taught him that such a training of his servants was unjust and dangerous. A sort of chronic remorse went with him everywhere, although not strong enough to make any decided change in his course and this very remorse reacted again into indulgence. He passed lightly over the most serious faults, because he told himself that, if he had done his part, his dependents had not fallen into them. Tom regarded his gay, airy, handsome young master with an odd mixture of fealty, reverence, and fatherly solicitude. That he never read the Bible, never went to church, that he jested and made free with any and everything that came in the way of his wits, that he spent his Sunday evenings at the opera or theatre, that he went to wine-parties and clubs and suppers oftener than was at all expedient, were all things that Tom could see as plainly as anybody, and on which he based a conviction that Massa wasn't a Christian, a conviction, however, which he would have been very slow to express to any one else, but on which he founded many prayers in his own simple fashion when he was by himself in his little dormitory. Not that Tom had not his own way of speaking his mind occasionally, with something of the tact often observable in his class. As, for example, the very day after the Sabbath we have described, St. Clair was invited out to a convivial party of choice spirits, and was helped home, between one and two o'clock at night, in a condition when the physical had decidedly attained the upper hand of the intellectual. Tom and Adolph assisted to get him composed for the night, the latter in high spirits evidently regarding the matter as a good joke, and laughing heartily at the rusticity of Tom's horror, who really was simple enough to lie awake most of the rest of the night praying for his young master. "'Well, Tom, what are you waiting for?' said St. Clair the next day, as he sat in his library in dressing-gown and slippers. St. Clair had just been entrusting Tom with some money and various commissions. "'Isn't all right there, Tom?' he added, as Tom still stood waiting. "'I'm afraid not, Massa,' said Tom, with a grave voice. St. Clair laid down his paper, and set down his coffee-cup, and looked at Tom. "'Why, Tom, what's the case? You look as solemn as a coffin.' 
I feel very bad, Massa. I always had thought that Massa would be good to everybody. Well, Tom, haven't I been? Come now, what do you want? There's something you haven't got, I suppose, and this is the preface. Massa always been good to me. I haven't nothing to complain of on that head, but there is one that Massa isn't good to. Why, Tom, what's got into you? Speak out. What do you mean? Last night, between one and two, I thought so. I studied upon the matter, then. Massa isn't good to himself." Tom said this with his back to his master and his hand on the doorknob. St. Clair felt his face flush crimson, but he laughed. "'Oh, that's all, is it?' he said gaily. "'All!' said Tom, turning suddenly round and falling on his knees. "'Oh, my dear young master, I'm afraid it will be loss of all, all body and soul. The good book says, It biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder, my dear massa." Tom's voice choked, and the tears ran down his cheeks. "'You poor silly fools,' said St. Clair, with tears in his own eyes. "'Get up, Tom. I'm not worth crying over.' But Tom wouldn't rise, and looked imploringly. "'Well, I won't go to any more of their cursed nonsense, Tom,' said St. Clair. "'On my honor, I won't. I don't know why I haven't stopped long ago. I've always despised it, and myself for it. So, now, Tom, wipe up your eyes, and go about your errands. Come, come, he added. No blessings. I'm not so wonderfully good now, he said, as he gently pushed Tom to the door. There, I'll pledge my honor to you, Tom. You don't see me so again, he said. And Tom went off, wiping his eyes with great satisfaction. I'll keep my faith with him, too said St. Clair, as he closed the door. And St. Clair did so, for gross sensualism in any form was not the peculiar temptation of his nature. But all this time who shall detail the tribulations manifold of our friend Miss Ophelia, who had begun the labors of a southern housekeeper? There is all the difference in the world in the servants of southern establishments, according to the character and capacity of the mistresses who have brought them up. South, as well as North, there are women who have an extraordinary talent for command, and tact in educating. Such are enabled, with apparent ease, and without severity, to subject to their will, and bring into harmonious and systematic order, the various members of their small estate, to regulate their peculiarities, and to balance and compensate the deficiencies of one by the excess of another, as to produce a harmonious and orderly system. Such a housekeeper was Mrs. Shelby, whom we have already described, and such our readers may remember to have met with. If they are not common at the South, it is because they are not common in the world. They are to be found there as often as anywhere, and, when existing, find in that peculiar state of society a brilliant opportunity to exhibit their domestic talent. Such a housekeeper Marie St. Clair was not, nor her mother before her. Indolent and childish, unsystematic and improvident, it was not to be expected that servants trained under her care should not be so likewise, and she had very justly described to Miss Ophelia the state of confusion she would find in the family, though she had not ascribed it to the proper cause. The first morning of her regency Miss Ophelia was up at four o'clock, and having attended to all the adjustments of her own chamber, as she had done ever since she came there, to the great amazement of the chambermaid, she prepared for a vigorous onslaught on the cupboards and closets of the establishment of which she had the keys. The storeroom, the linen presses, the china closet, the kitchen and the cellar, that day all went under an awful review. Hidden things of darkness were brought to light to an extent that alarmed all the principalities and powers of kitchen and chamber, and caused many wonderings and murmurings about, "'These yer northern ladies!' from the domestic cabinet. Old Dinah, the head cook, and principal of all rule and authority in the kitchen department, was filled with wrath at what she considered an invasion of privilege. No feudal baron in Magna Carta times could have more thoroughly resented some incursion of the crown. Dinah was a character in her own way, and it would be injustice to her memory not to give the reader a little idea of her. She was a native and essential cook, as much as Aunt Chloe, cooking being an indigenous talent of the African race. 
but Chloe was a trained and methodical one who moved in an orderly domestic harness, while Dinah was a self-taught genius, and, like geniuses in general, was positive, opinionated, and erratic to the last degree. Like a certain class of modern philosophers, Dinah perfectly scorned logic and reason in every shape, and always took refuge in intuitive certainty, and here she was perfectly impregnable. No possible amount of talent, or authority, or explanation could ever make her believe that any other way was better than her own, or that the course she had pursued in the smallest matter could be in the least modified. This had been a conceded point with her old mistress, Marie's mother, and Miss Marie, as Dinah always called her young mistress, even after her marriage, found it easier to submit than contend, and so Dinah had ruled supreme. This was the easier in that she was perfect mistress of that diplomatic art which unites the utmost subservience of manner with the utmost inflexibility as to measure. Dinah was mistress of the whole art and mystery of excuse-making, in all its branches. Indeed, it was an axiom with her that the cook can do no wrong, and a cook in a southern kitchen finds abundance of heads and shoulders on which to lay off every sin and frailty, so as to maintain her own immaculateness entire. If any part of the dinner was a failure, there were fifty indisputably good reasons for it, and it was the fault undeniably of fifty other people, whom Dinah berated with unsparing zeal. But it was very seldom that there was any failure in Dinah's last results. Though her mode of doing everything was peculiarly meandering and circuitous, and without any sort of calculation as to time and place, though her kitchen generally looked as if it had been arranged by a hurricane blowing through it, and she had about as many places for each cooking utensil as there were days in the year, yet if one would have patience to wait her own good time, up would come her dinner in perfect order, and in a style of preparation with which an epicure could find no fault. It was now the season of incipient preparation for dinner. Dinah, who required large intervals of reflection and repose, and was studious of ease in all her arrangements, was seated on the kitchen floor, smoking a short stumpy pipe, to which she was much addicted, and which she always kindled up as a sort of censer whenever she felt the need of an inspiration in her arrangements. It was Dinah's mode of invoking the domestic muses. Seated around her were various members of that rising race with which a southern household abounds, engaged in shelling peas, peeling potatoes, picking pin-feathers out of fowls, and other preparatory arrangements, Dinah every once in a while interrupting her meditations to give a poke or a rap on the head to some of the young operators, with a pudding-stick that lay by her side. In fact, Dinah ruled over the woolly heads of the younger members with a rod of iron, and seemed to consider them born for no earthly purpose but to save her steps, as she phrased it. It was the spirit of the system under which she had grown up, and she carried it out to its full extent. Miss Ophelia, after passing on her reformatory tour through all the other parts of the establishment, now entered the kitchen. Dinah had heard from various sources what was going on, and resolved to stand on defensive and conservative ground, mentally determined to oppose and ignore every new measure without any actual observable contest. The kitchen was a large brick-floored apartment, with a great old-fashioned fireplace stretching along one side of it, an arrangement which St. Clair had vainly tried to persuade Dinah to exchange for the convenience of a modern cook-stove. Not she! No Puseyite, note, Edward Bouverie Pusey, 1800 to 1888, champion of the orthodoxy of revealed religion, defender of the Oxford movement, and requius professor of Hebrew and canon of Christ Church, Oxford. Not she, no Puseyite, or conservative of any school, was ever more inflexibly attached to time-honored inconveniences than Dinah. When St. Clair had first returned from the North, impressed with the system and order of his uncle's kitchen arrangements, he had largely provided his own with an array of cupboards, drawers, and various apparatus to induce systematic regulation, under the sanguine illusion that it would be of any possible assistance to Dinah in her arrangements. He might as well have provided them for a squirrel or a magpie. The more drawers and closets there were, 
the more hiding-holes could Dinah make for the accommodation of old rags, hair-combs, old shoes, ribbons, cast-off artificial flowers, and other articles of vertu wherein her soul delighted. When Miss Ophelia entered the kitchen, Dinah did not rise, but smoked on in sublime tranquillity, regarding her movements obliquely out of the corner of her eye, but apparently intent only on the operations around her. Miss Ophelia commenced opening a set of drawers. "'What is this drawer for, Dinah?' she said. "'It's handy for most anything, missus,' said Dinah. So it appeared to be. From the variety it contained, Miss Ophelia pulled out first a fine damask tablecloth stained with blood, having evidently been used to envelop some raw meat. "'What's this, Dinah? You don't wrap up meat in your mistress's best tablecloths?' "'Oh, Lord, missus, no! The towels was all a-missin', so I just did it. I laid out to wash that, uh, that's why I put it thar. Shiftless, said Miss Ophelia to herself, proceeding to tumble over the drawer, where she found a nutmeg grater and two or three nutmegs, a Methodist hymn-book, a couple of soiled madras handkerchiefs, some yarn and knitting-work, a paper of tobacco and a pipe, a few crackers, one or two gilded china saucers with some pomade in them, one or two thin old shoes, a piece of flannel carefully pinned up enclosing some small white onions, several damask table-napkins, some coarse crash-towels, some twine and darning-needles, and several broken papers, from which sundry sweet herbs were sifting into the drawer. "'Where do you keep your nutmegs, Dinah?' said Miss Ophelia, with the air of one who prayed for patience. "'Most anywhere, missus. There's some in that cracked teacup up there, and there's some over in that ar cupboard.' "'Here are some in the grater,' said Miss Ophelia, holding them up. "'Laws, yes, I put them there this morning. I likes to keep my things handy,' said Dinah. "'You, Jake, what are you stopping for? You'll catch it. Be still there,' she added with a dive of her stick at the criminal. "'What's this?' said Miss Ophelia, holding up the saucer of pomade. "'No, it's my grease. I put it thar to have it handy. Do you use your mistress's best saucers for that?' "'No, it was cause I was driv in such a hurry. I was gwine to change it this very day. Here are two damask table-napkins. Them table-napkins I put thar to get em washed out some day. Don't you have some place here on purpose for things to be washed?' "'Well, Massa St. Clair got dat our chest,' he said, for dat. "'But I likes to mix up biscuits and have my things on it some days, and then it ain't handier liftin' up the lid.' "'Why don't you mix your biscuits on the pastry-table there?' "'Lo, miss, it gets sot so full of dishes, and, and one thing another, and there ain't no room no way. "'But you should wash your dishes and clear them away.' "'Wash my dishes!' said Dinah, in a high key, as her wrath began to rise over her habitual respect of manner. "'What does ladies know about work, I want to know? When'd master ever get his dinner, if I was to spend all my time a-washin' and puttin' up dishes? Miss Marie never tell me so, no how. "'Well, here are these onions.' "'Laws, yes,' said Dinah. "'There is where I put em now. I couldn't remember. Them's particular onions I was a-savin' for dis yar very stew. I had forgot they was in dat our old flannel." Miss Ophelia lifted out the sifting papers of sweet herbs. "'I wish missus wouldn't touch them. I, I likes to keep my things where I knows where to go to em, said Dinah, rather decidedly. "'But you don't want these holes in the papers?' "'Them's handy for sifting on out,' said Dinah. "'But you see it spills all over the drawer. Laws, yes. If missus will go all a tumblin' things all up, so it will. Missus has spilt lots dat our way," said Dinah, coming uneasily to the drawers. If missus only will go up stars till my clarin' up time comes, I'll have everything right. But I can't do nothin' when ladies is round a hinderin'. You, Sam, don't you give the baby dat our sugar bowl. I'll crack you over if you don't mind. I'm going through the kitchen, and going to put everything in order once, Dinah, and then I'll expect you to keep it so. Lord, now, Miss Velia, dat ar ain't no way for ladies to do. I never did see ladies doin' no sich. My old missus, uh, nor Miss Marie, never did, and I don't see no kinder need on it. 
and Dinah stalked indignantly about while Miss Ophelia piled and sorted dishes, emptied dozens of scattering bowls of sugar into one receptacle, sorted napkins, tablecloths, and towels for washing, washing, wiping, and arranging with her own hands, and with a speed and alacrity which perfectly amazed Dinah. "'Lord, now, if dat are de way dem northern ladies do, dey ain't ladies nohow,' she said to some of her satellites, when at a safe hearing distance. "'I has things as straight as anybody, when my clarin' up times comes. But I don't want ladies round a handerin' and gettin' my things all where I can't find em. To do Dinah justice, she had, at irregular periods, paroxysms of reformation and arrangement, which she called clarin' up times, when she would begin with great zeal, and turn every drawer and closet wrong side outward, on to the floor or tables, and make the ordinary confusion sevenfold more confounded. Then she would light her pipe, and leisurely go over her arrangements, looking things over, and discoursing upon them making all the young fry scour most vigorously on the tin things, and keeping up for several hours a most energetic state of confusion, which she would explain to the satisfaction of all inquirers by the remark that she was a clarin' up. She couldn't have things a gwine on so as they had been, and she was gwine to make these yar young ones keep better order, for Dinah herself somehow indulged the illusion that she, herself, was the soul of order and it was only the young uns and the everybody else in the house that were the cause of anything that fell short of perfection in this respect. When all the tins were scoured, and the tables scrubbed snowy white, and everything that could offend tucked out of sight in holes and corners, Dinah would dress herself up in a smart dress, clean apron, and high, brilliant madras turban, and tell all marauding young uns to keep out of the kitchen, for she was going to have things kept nice. Indeed, these periodic seasons were often an inconvenience to the whole household, for Dinah would contract such an immoderate attachment to her scoured tin as to insist upon it that it shouldn't be used again for any possible purpose, at least till the ardor of the clarin' up period abated. Miss Ophelia, in a few days, thoroughly reformed every department of the house to a systematic pattern but her labors in all departments that depended on the cooperation of servants were like those of Sisyphus or Deniades. In despair she one day appealed to St. Clair. "'There is no such thing as getting anything like a system in this family.' "'To be sure there isn't,' said St. Clair. "'Such shiftless management, such waste, such confusion, I never saw. I dare say you didn't. You would not take it so coolly if you were housekeeper.' "'My dear cousin, you may as well understand, once for all, that we masters are divided into two classes, oppressors and oppressed. We who are good-natured and hate severity make up our minds to a good deal of inconvenience. If we will keep a shambling, loose, untaught set in the community for our convenience, why, we must take the consequence. Some rare cases I have seen of persons who, by a peculiar tact, can produce order and system without severity. But I'm not one of them, and so I made up my mind long ago to let things go just as they do. I will not have the poor devils thrashed and cut to pieces, and they know it, and of course they know the staff is in their own hands. But to have no time, no place, no order, all going on in this shiftless way— my dear Vermont, you natives up by the North Pole set an extravagant value on time. What on earth is the use of time to a fellow who has twice as much of it as he knows what to do with? As to order and system, where there is nothing to be done but to lounge on the sofa and read, an hour sooner or later in breakfast or dinner isn't of much account. Now, there's Dinah gets you a capital dinner, soup, ragout, roast fowl, dessert, ice-creams and all, and she creates it all out of chaos, and old night down there in that kitchen. I think it really sublime the way she manages. But heaven bless us, if we are to go down there and view all the smoking and squatting about, and hurry scurriation of the preparatory process, we should never eat more. My good cousin, absolve yourself from that. It's more than a Catholic penance, and does no more good. You'll only lose your own temper and utterly confound Dinah. Let her go her own way." "'But, Augustine, you don't know how I found things.' "'Don't I? 
Don't I know that the rolling pin is under her bed, and the nutmeg grater in her pocket with her tobacco? That there are sixty-five different sugar-bowls, one in every hole in the house? That she washes dishes with a dinner-napkin one day, and with a fragment of an old petticoat the next? But the upshot is, she gets up glorious dinners, makes superb coffee, and you must judge her as warriors and statesmen are judged, by her success. But the waste, the expense! Oh, well, lock everything you can, and keep the keys, give out by driblets, and never inquire for odds and ends. It isn't best. That troubles me, Augustine. I can't help feeling as if these servants were not strictly honest. Are you sure they can be relied on?" Augustine laughed immoderately at the grave and anxious face with which Miss Ophelia propounded the question. "'Oh, cousin, that's too good. Honest? <laughs> as if that's a thing to be expected. Honest? Why, of course they aren't. Why should they be? What upon earth is to make them so? Why don't you instruct? Instruct? Oh, fiddlestick! What instructing do you think I should do? I look like it. As to Marie, she has spirit enough, to be sure, to kill off a whole plantation, if I'd let her manage. But she wouldn't get the cheatery out of them. Are there no honest ones? Well, now and then one, whom nature makes so impractically simple, truthful, and faithful, that the worst possible influence can't destroy it. But you see, from the mother's breast, the colored child feels and sees that there are none but underhand ways open to it. It can get along no other way with its parents, its mistress, its young master and missy playfellows. Cunning and deception become necessary, inevitable habits. It isn't fair to expect anything else of him. He ought not to be punished for it. As to honesty, the slave is kept in that dependent, semi-childish state that there is no making him realize the rights of property, or feel that his master's goods are not his own, if he can get them. For my part, I don't see how they can be honest. Such a fellow as Tom here is—is is a moral miracle." "'And what becomes of their souls?' said Miss Ophelia. "'That isn't my affair, as I know of,' said St. Clair. "'I am only dealing in facts of the present life. The fact is that the whole race are pretty generally understood to be turned over to the devil for our benefit in this world, however it may turn out in another." This is perfectly horrible," said Miss Ophelia. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. I don't know as I am. We are in pretty good company for all that," said St. Clair, as people in the broad road generally are. Look at the high and the low, all the world over, and it's the same story. The lower class used up body, soul, and spirit for the good of the upper. It is so in England, it is so everywhere and yet all Christendom stands aghast with virtuous indignation, because we do the thing in a little different shape from what they do it. It isn't so in Vermont. Ah, well, in New England, and in the free states, you have the better of us, I grant. But uh, there's the bell. So, cousin, let us for a while lay aside our sectional prejudices, and come out to dinner." As Miss Ophelia was in the kitchen, in the latter part of the afternoon, some of the sable children called out, La sakes! Dye's Prue a comin', grantin' along, like she allers does." A tall, bony-coloured woman now entered the kitchen, bearing on her head a basket of rusks and hot rolls. "'How, oh, Prue, you come!' said Dinah. Prue had a peculiar scowling expression of countenance, and a sullen, grumbling voice. She set down her basket, squatted herself down, and, resting her elbows on her knees, said, "'Oh, Lord, I wished I was dead! "'Why do you wish you were dead?' said Miss Ophelia. "'I'd be out of my misery,' said the woman gruffly, without taking her eyes from the floor. "'What need you getting drunk, then, and cutting up, Prue?' said a spruce quadroon chambermaid, dangling as she spoke a pair of coral eardrops. The woman looked at her with a sour, surly glance. "'Maybe you'll come to it one of these yardays. I'd be glad to see you, I would. Then you'll be glad of a drop like me to forget your misery.' "'Come, Prue,' said Dinah. "'Let's look at your rusks. Here's Mrs. will pay for them.' Miss Ophelia took out a couple of dozen. "'There's some tickets in that are old crack jug on the top shelf,' said Dinah. "'You, Jake, climb up and get it down.' "'Tickets? 
what are they for? said Miss Ophelia. We buy tickets of her massa, and she gives us bread for em. And they counts my money and tickets when I gets home, to see if I's got the change, and if I hadn't, uh, they half kills me. And serves you right, said Jane, the pert chambermaid. If you will take their money to get drunk on, that's what she does, missus. And that's what I will do. I can't live no other ways. Drink and forget my misery. You are very wicked and very foolish, said Miss Ophelia, to steal your master's money to make yourself a brute with. It's mighty likely, missus, but I will do it. Yes, I will, O oh Lord. I wish I's dead, I do. I wish I's dead and out of my misery. And slowly and stiffly the old creature rose and got her basket on her head again, and before she went out she looked at the quadroon girl, who still stood playing with her eardrops. Ye think you're mighty fine with them, are a frolicking and a tossin' your head and a lookin' down on everybody. Well, never mind. You may live to be a poor old cut-up critter like me. Hope to Lord you will, I do. Then see if you won't drink. Drink! Drink yourself into torment, and sarve your right to a— uh. And with a malignant howl the woman left the room. "'Disgustin' old beast,' said Adolph, who was getting his master's shaving water. "'If I was her master, I'd cut her up worse than she is.' "'He couldn't do that, ar. No way,' said Dinah. "'Her back's a far sight now. She can't never get a dress together over it.' "'I think such low creatures ought not to be allowed to go round to genteel families,' said Miss Jane. "'What do you think, Miss St. Clair?' she said, coquettishly tossing her head at Adolph. It must be observed that, among other appropriations from his master's stock, Adolph was in the habit of adopting his name and address, and that the style under which he moved among the colored circles of New Orleans was that of Mr. St. Clair. "'I'm certainly of your opinion, Miss Benoit,' said Adolph. Benoit was the name of Marie St. Clair's family, and Jane was one of her servants. "'Pray, Miss Benoit, may I be allowed to ask if those drops are for the ball to-morrow night? They are certainly bewitching.' "'I wonder now, Mr. St. Clair, what the impudence of you men will come to,' said Jane, tossing her pretty head till the eardrops twinkled again. "'I shan't dance with you for a whole evening, if you go to asking me any more questions.' "'Oh, you couldn't be so cruel now.' "'I was just dying to know whether you would appear in your pink tarlatan,' said Adolph. "'What is it?' said Rosa, a bright, piquant little quadroon who came skipping downstairs at this moment. "'Why, Mr. St. Clair is so impudent!' "'On my honor, said Adolph, I'll leave it to Miss Rosa now.' "'I know he's always a saucy creature,' said Rosa, poising herself on one of her little feet, and looking maliciously at Adolph. He's always getting me so angry with him. Oh, ladies, ladies, you will certainly break my heart between you, said Adolph. I shall be found dead in my bed some morning, and you'll have it to answer for. Do we hear the horrid creature talk? said both ladies, laughing immoderately. Come, clear out, you. I can't have you cluttering up the kitchen, said Dinah, in my way fooling round here. And Dinah's glum because she can't go to the ball, said Rosa. "'Don't want none of your light-colored balls,' said Dinah. "'Cutting round, making believe you's white folks. After all, you's niggers much as I am.' "'Aunt Dinah greases her wool stiff every day to make it lie straight,' said Jane. "'It will be wool, after all,' said Rosa, maliciously shaking down her long, silky curls. "'Well, in the Lord's sight, ain't wool as good as bar any time,' said Dinah. "'I'd like to have Mrs. say which is worth the most.' A couple such as you, or one like me. Get out with you, you trumpery. I won't have you round. Here the conversation was interrupted in a twofold manner. St. Clair's voice was heard at the head of the stairs, asking Adolph if he meant to stay all night with his shaving water, and Miss Ophelia, coming out of the dining room, said, Jane and Rosa, what are you wasting your time for here? Go in and attend to your muslins. Our friend Tom, who had been in the kitchen during the conversation with the old Rusk woman, had followed her out into the street. He saw her go on, giving every once in a while a suppressed groan. At last she set her basket down on a doorstep, and began arranging the old faded shawl which covered her shoulders. "'I'll carry your basket apiece,' said Tom compassionately. "'Why should ye?' said the woman. "'I don't want no help.' 
"'You seem to be sick, or in trouble, or something,' said Tom. "'I ain't sick,' said the woman shortly. "'I wish,' said Tom, looking at her earnestly, "'I wish I could persuade you to leave off drinking. Don't you know it will be the ruin of you, body and soul?' "'I knows I'm going to torment,' said the woman sullenly. "'You don't need to tell me that, our eyes ugly, eyes wicked, eyes gwine straight to torment. Oh, Lord, I wished eyes are!' Tom shuddered at these frightful words, spoken with a sullen, impassioned earnestness. "'Oh, Lord, have mercy on you, poor critter! Ain't ye never heard of Jesus Christ?' "'Jesus Christ? Who's he?' "'Why, he's the Lord,' said Tom. "'I think I've hearn tell o' the Lord, and the judgment and torment. I heard that.' "'But didn't anybody ever tell you of the Lord Jesus, that loved us poor sinners, and died for us?' "'Don't know nothing about that,' said the woman. "'Nobody had never loved me since my old man died.' "'Where was you raised?' said Tom. Up in Kentuck, a man kept me to breed chillin for market and sold em as fast as they got big enough. Last of all, he sold me to a speculator, and my master got me o him. What set you into this bad way of drinking? To shit out my misery. I had one child after I come here, and I thought that I'd have one to raise, cause massa wasn't a speculator. It was the beardest little thing, and missus she seemed to think a heap on't at first. It never cried. It was likely and fat. But Mrs. Tuck sick, and I tended her, and I took the fever, and my milk all left me, and the child it pined to skin and bone, and Mrs. wouldn't buy milk for it. She wouldn't hear to me when I told her I hadn't milk. She said she knowed I could feed it on what other folks eat, and the child kinder pined and cried and cried and cried, day and night, and got all gone to skin and bones, and Mrs. got sot again it and she said twasn't nothing but crossness. She wished it was dead, she said, and she wouldn't let me have it o' nights, cause she said it kept me awake and made me good for nothing. She made me sleep in her room, and I had to put it away off in a little kind of garret, and thar it cried itself to death one night. It did, and I took to drinkin' to keep its crying out of my ears, I did, and I will drink. I will, if I do go to torment for it. Master says I shall go to torment, and I tell him I've got thar now. Oh, ye poor critter, said Tom. Hadn't nobody never telled ye how the Lord Jesus loved ye and died for ye? Hadn't they telled ye that he'll help ye, and ye can go to heaven and have rest at last? I looks like gwine to heaven, said the woman. Ain't thar where white folks is gwine? Suppose they's have me thar? I'd rather go to torment and get away from master and missus. I had so, she said, as with her usual groan. She got her basket on her head and walked sullenly away. Tom turned and walked sorrowfully back to the house. In the court he met little Eva, a crown of tuberoses on her head, and her eyes radiant with delight. Oh, Tom, here you are. I'm glad I found you. Papa says you may get out the ponies and take me in my little new carriage she said, catching his hand. But what's the matter, Tom? You look sober. I feel bad, Miss Eva, said Tom sorrowfully. But I'll get the horses for you. But do tell me, Tom, what is the matter? I saw you talking to cross old Prue. Tom, in simple earnest phrase, told Eva the woman's history. She did not exclaim or wonder or weep as other children do. Her cheeks grew pale, and a deep, earnest shadow passed over her eyes. She laid both hands on her bosom and sighed heavily. End of chapter 18 and volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Volume 2, Chapter 19 Miss Ophelia's experiences and opinions continued. "'Tom, you needn't get me the horses. I don't want to go,' she said. "'Why not, Miss Eva?' "'These things sink into my heart, Tom,' said Eva. "'They sink into my heart,' she repeated earnestly. "'I don't want to go.' And she turned from Tom and went into the house. 
A few days after, another woman came in old Prue's place to bring the rusks. Miss Ophelia was in the kitchen. "'Lor!' said Dinah. "'What's got Prue?' "'Prue isn't coming any more,' said the woman mysteriously. "'Why not?' said Dinah. "'She ain't dead, is she?' "'We doesn't exactly know. She's down cellar,' said the woman, glancing at Miss Ophelia. After Miss Ophelia had taken the rusks, Dinah followed the woman to the door. "'What has got Prue, anyhow?' she said. The woman seemed desirous, yet reluctant to speak, and answered in low, mysterious tone, "'Well, you mustn't tell nobody. Prue, she got drunk again, and they had her down cellar, and thar they left her all day. And I hearn em say that the flies had got to her, and she's dead.' Dinah held up her hands, and, turning, saw close by her side the spirit-like form of Evangeline, her large, mystic eyes dilated with horror, and every drop of blood driven from her lips and cheeks. "'Lord bless us! Miss Eva's going faint away! What got us all to let her hair such talk? Her pa'll be rail mad!' "'I shan't faint, Dinah,' said the child firmly. "'And why shouldn't I hear it? It ain't so much for me to hear it as for poor Prue to suffer it. Lor sakes, it isn't for sweet, delicate young ladies like you. These yer stories isn't. It's enough to kill em. Eva sighed again, and walked upstairs with a slow and melancholy step. Miss Ophelia anxiously inquired the woman's story. Dinah gave a very garrulous version of it, to which Tom added the particulars which he had drawn from her that morning. "'An abominable business! Perfectly horrible!' she exclaimed as she entered the room where St. Clair lay reading his paper. "'Pray, what iniquity has turned up now?' said he. "'What now? Why, those folks have whipped Prue to death,' said Miss Ophelia, going on with great strength of detail into the story, and enlarging on its most shocking particulars. "'I thought it would come to that some time,' said St. Clair, going on with his paper. "'Thought so. Aren't you going to do anything about it?' said Miss Ophelia. Haven't you got any select men or anybody to interfere and look after such matters? It's commonly supposed that the property interest is a sufficient guard in these cases. If people choose to ruin their own possessions, I don't know what's to be done. It seems the poor creature was a thief and a drunkard, and so there won't be much hope to get up sympathy for her. It is perfectly outrageous! It is horrid, Augustine! It will certainly bring down vengeance upon you. My dear cousin, I didn't do it, and I can't help it. I would, if I could. If low-minded, brutal people will act like themselves, what am I to do? They have absolute control. They are irresponsible despots. There would be no use in interfering. There is no law that amounts to anything practically for such a case. The best we can do is to shut our eyes and ears, and let it alone. It's the only resource left us. How can you shut your eyes and ears? How can you let such things alone? My dear child, what do you expect? Here is a whole class, debased, uneducated, indolent, provoking, put, without any sort of terms or conditions, entirely into the hands of such people as the majority in our world are, people who have neither consideration nor self-control, who haven't even an enlightened regard to their own interest, for that's the case with the largest half of mankind. Of course, in a community so organized, what can a man of honorable and humane feelings do but shut his eyes all he can and harden his heart? I can't buy every wretch I see. I can't turn knight-errant and undertake to redress every individual case of wrong in such a city as this. The most I can do is to try and keep out of the way of it." St. Clair's fine countenance was for a moment overcast. He said, "'Come, cousin. Don't stand there looking like one of the fates. You've only seen a peep through the curtain, a specimen of what is going on, the world over, in some shape or other. If we are to be prying and spying into all the dismals of life, we should have no heart to anything. Tis like looking too close into the details of Dinah's kitchen. And St. Clair lay back on the sofa, and busied himself with his paper. Miss Ophelia sat down, and pulled out her knitting-work and sat there grim with indignation. She knit and knit. But while she mused, the fire burned. At last she broke out. "'I tell you, Augustine, I can't!
can't get over things so if you can. It's a perfect abomination for you to defend such a system. That's my mind. What now? said St. Clair, looking up. At it again, hey? I say it's perfectly abominable for you to defend such a system, said Miss Ophelia, with increasing warmth. I defend it, my dear lady. Whoever said I did defend it? said St. Clair. Of course you defend it. You all do, all you Southerners. What do you have slaves for if you don't? Are you such a sweet innocent as to suppose nobody in this world ever does what they don't think is right? Don't you, or didn't you ever, do anything that you did not think quite right? If I do, I repent of it, I hope," said Miss Ophelia, rattling her needles with energy. "'So do I,' said St. Clair, peeling his orange. "'I'm repenting of it all the time. What do you keep on doing it for? Didn't you ever keep on doing wrong after you'd repented, my good cousin?' "'Well, only when I've been very much tempted,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Well, I'm very much tempted.' said St. Clair. That's just my difficulty. But I always resolve I won't, and I try to break off. Well, I have been resolving I won't, off and on, these ten years, said St. Clair. But I haven't, somehow, got clear. Have you got clear of all your sins, cousin? Cousin Augustine, said Miss Ophelia, seriously, and laying down her knitting-work, I suppose I deserve that you should reprove my shortcomings. I know all you say is true enough. Nobody else feels them more than I do. But it does seem to me, after all, there is some difference between me and you. It seems to me I would cut off my right hand sooner than keep on, from day to day, doing what I thought was wrong. But then my conduct is so inconsistent with my profession. I don't wonder you reprove me." "'Oh, now, cousin,' said Augustine, sitting down on the floor and laying his head back in her lap. Don't take on so awfully serious. You know what a good-for-nothing saucy boy I always was. I love to poke you up, that's all, just to see you get earnest. I do think you are desperately, distressingly good. It tires me to death to think of it." "'But this is a serious subject, my boy, August,' said Miss Ophelia, laying her hand on his forehead. "'Dismally so,' said he. And I—well, I never want to talk seriously in hot weather. What with mosquitoes and all, a fellow can't get himself up to any very sublime moral flights. And I believe," said St. Clair, suddenly rousing himself up, "'there's a theory now. I understand now why northern nations are always more virtuous than southern ones. I see into that whole subject. Oh, Augustine, you are a sad rattle-brain. Am I? Well, so I am, I suppose. But for once I will be serious now. But you must hand me that basket of oranges. You see, you'll have to stay me with flagons and comfort me with apples, if I'm going to make this effort now," said Augustine, drawing the basket up. I'll begin. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for a fellow to hold two or three dozen of his fellow worms in captivity, a decent regard to the opinions of society requires— "'I don't see that you are growing more serious,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Wait. I'm coming on. You'll hear. The short of the matter is, cousin,' said he, his handsome face suddenly settling into an earnest and serious expression, "'on this abstract question of slavery there can, as I think, be but one opinion. Planters who have money to make by it clergymen who have planters to please, politicians who want to rule by it, may warp and bend language and ethics to a degree that shall astonish the world at their ingenuity. They can press nature and the Bible, and nobody knows what else, into the service. But, after all, neither they nor the world believe in it one particle the more. It comes from the devil, that's the short of it and to my mind it's a pretty respectable specimen of what he can do in his own line." Miss Ophelia stopped her knitting and looked surprised, and St. Clair, apparently enjoying her astonishment, went on. "'You seem to wonder. But if you will get me fairly at it, I'll make a clean breast of it. This cursed business, a curse of God and man, what is it? Strip it of all its ornament, run it down to the root and nucleus of the whole, and what is it? Why, because my brother Quashi is ignorant and weak, and I am intelligent and strong, because I know how and can do it, therefore 
I may steal all he has, keep it, and give him only such and so much as suits my fancy. Whatever is too hard, too dirty, too disagreeable for me, I may set Quashi to doing. Because I don't like work, Quashi shall work. Because the sun burns me, Quashi shall stay in the sun. Quashi shall earn the money, and I will spend it. Quashi shall lie down in every puddle, that I may walk over dry shod. Quashi shall do my will, and not his, all the days of his mortal life, and have such chance of getting to heaven, at last, as I find convenient. This I take to be about what slavery is. I defy anybody on earth to read our slave code as it stands in our law-books, and make anything else of it. Talk of the abuses of slavery! Humbug! The thing itself is the essence of all abuse. And the only reason why the land don't sink under it, like Sodom and Gomorrah, is because it is used in a way infinitely better than it is. For pity's sake, for shame's sake, because we are men born of women and not savage beasts, many of us do not, and dare not, we would scorn to use the full power which our savage laws put into our hands. And he who goes the furthest and does the worst only uses, within limits, the power that the law gives him. St. Clair has started up, and, as his manner was when excited, was walking, with hurried steps, up and down the floor. His fine face, classic as that of a Greek statue, seemed actually to burn with the fervor of his feelings. His large blue eyes flashed, and he gestured with an unconscious earnestness. Miss Ophelia had never seen him in this mood before, and she sat perfectly silent. "'I declare to you,' said he, suddenly stopping before his cousin, it's no sort of use to talk or to feel on this subject, but I declare to you, there have been times when I have thought, if the whole country would sink, and hide all this injustice and misery from the light, I would willingly sink with it. When I have been travelling up and down on our boats, or about on my collecting tours, and reflected that every brutal, disgusting, mean, low-lived fellow I met was allowed by our laws to become absolute despot of as many men, women, and children as he could cheat, steal, or gamble money enough to buy, when I have seen such men in actual ownership of helpless children, of young girls and women, I have been ready to curse my country, to curse the human race. "'Augustine, Augustine!' said Miss Ophelia. "'I'm sure you've said enough. I never in my life heard anything like this, even at the North.' "'At the North,' said St. Clair, with a sudden change of expression, and resuming something of his habitual careless tone. "'Pooh! Your Northern folk are cold-blooded. You are cool in everything. You can't begin to curse uphill and down as we can, when we get fairly at it.' "'Well, but the question is,' said Miss Ophelia, "'oh, yes, to be sure, the question is, and a deuce of a question it is, how came you in this state of sin and misery? Well, I shall answer in the good old words you used to teach me, Sundays. I came so by ordinary generation. My servants were my father's, and, what is more, my mother's, and now they are mine, they and their increase, which bids fair to be a pretty considerable item.' My father, you know, came first from New England, and he was just such another man as your father, a regular old Roman, upright, energetic, noble-minded, with an iron will. Your father settled down in New England, to rule over rocks and stones, and to force an existence out of nature, and mine settled in Louisiana, to rule over men and women, and force existence out of them. My mother, said St. Clair, getting up and walking to a picture at the end of the room, and gazing upward with a face fervent with veneration. She was divine. Don't look at me so. You know what I mean. She probably was of mortal birth, but, as far as ever I could observe, there was no trace of any human weakness or error about her, and everybody that lives to remember her, whether bond or free, servant, acquaintance, relation, all say the same. Why, cousin, that mother has been all that has stood between me and utter unbelief for years. She was a direct embodiment and personification of the New Testament, a living fact to be accounted for, and to be accounted for in no other way than by its truth. "'Oh, mother, mother!' said St. Clair, clasping his hands in a sort of transport, and then suddenly checking himself he came back, and seating himself on an ottoman he went on. "'My brother and I were twins. And they say, you know, that twins ought to resemble each other. But we were in all points a contrast. 
He had black, fiery eyes, coal-black hair, a strong, fine, Roman profile, and a rich brown complexion. I had blue eyes, golden hair, a Greek outline, and fair complexion. He was active and observing, I dreamy and inactive. He was generous to his friends and equals, but proud, dominant, overbearing to inferiors, and utterly unmerciful to whatever set itself up against him. Truthful we both were, he from pride and courage, I from a sort of abstract ideality. We loved each other, about as boys generally do, off and on, and in general. He was my father's pet, and I my mother's. There was a morbid sensitiveness and acuteness of feeling in me on all possible subjects, of which he and my father had no kind of understanding, and with which they could have no possible sympathy. But mother did. And so, when I had quarrelled with Alfred, and father looked sternly on me, I used to go off to mother's room, and sit by her. I remember just how she used to look, with her pale cheeks, her deep, soft, serious eyes, her white dress. She always wore white. And I used to think of her whenever I read in Revelations about the saints that were arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. She had a great deal of genius of one sort and another, particularly in music. And she used to sit at her organ, playing fine old majestic music of the Catholic Church, and singing with a voice more like an angel than a mortal woman. And I would lay my head down on her lap, and cry, and dream, and feel, oh, immeasurably, things that I had no language to say. In those days this matter of slavery had never been canvassed as it has now. Nobody dreamed of any harm in it. My father was a born aristocrat. I think, in some pre-existent state, he must have been in the higher circles of spirits, and brought all his old court pride along with him. For it was in grain, bred in the bone, though he was originally of poor and not in any way of noble family. My brother was begotten in his image. Now an aristocrat, you know, the world over, has no human sympathies, beyond a certain line in society. In England the line is in one place, in Burma in another, and in America in another. But the aristocrat of all these countries never goes over it. What would be hardship and distress and injustice in his own class is a cool matter of course in another one. My father's dividing line was that of color. Among his equals never was a man more just and generous, but he considered the negro, through all possible gradations of color, as an intermediate link between man and animals, and graded all his ideas of justice or generosity on this hypothesis. I suppose to be true, if anybody had asked him, plump and fair, whether they had human immortal souls, he might have hemmed and hawed, and said yes. But my father was not a man much troubled with spiritualism. Religious sentiment he had none, beyond a veneration for God, as decidedly the head of the upper classes. Well, my father worked some five hundred negroes. He was an inflexible, driving, punctilious businessman. Everything was to move by system, to be sustained with unfailing accuracy and precision. Now, if you take into account that all this was to be worked out by a set of lazy, twaddling, shiftless laborers, who had grown up all their lives in the absence of every possible motive to learn how to do anything but shirk, as you Vermonters say, and you'll see that there might naturally be, on his plantation, a great many things that looked horrible and distressing to a sensitive child like me. Besides all, he had an overseer, great, tall, slab-sided, two-fisted renegade son of Vermont, begging your pardon, who had gone through a regular apprenticeship in hardness and brutality, and taken his degree to be admitted to practice. My mother never could endure him, nor I, but he obtained an entire ascendancy over my father, and this man was the absolute despot of the estate. I was a little fellow then but I had the same love that I have now for all kinds of human things, a kind of passion for the study of humanity, come in what shape it would. I was found in the cabins and among the field hands a great deal, and of course was a great favorite, and all sorts of complaints and grievances were breathed in my ear, and I told them to mother, and we, between us, formed a sort of committee for a redress of grievances. We hindered and repressed a great deal of cruelty and congratulated ourselves on doing a vast deal of good, till, as often happens, my zeal overacted. 
Stubbs complained to my father that he couldn't manage the hands, and must resign his position. Father was a fond, indulgent husband, but a man that never flinched from anything that he thought necessary. And so he put down his foot, like a rock, between us and the field hands. He told my mother, in language perfectly respectful and deferential, but quite explicit, that over the house-servants she should be entire mistress, but that with the field hands he could allow no interference. He revered and respected her above all living beings, but he would have said it all the same to the Virgin Mary herself, if she had come in the way of his system. I used sometimes to hear my mother reasoning cases with him, endeavouring to excite his sympathies. He would listen to the most pathetic appeals with the most discouraging politeness and equanimity. "'It all resolves itself into this,' he would say. "'Must I part with Stubbs, or keep him? Stubbs is the soul of punctuality, honesty, and efficiency, a thorough business hand, and as humane as the general run. We can't have perfection, and if I keep him, I must sustain his administration as a whole, even if there are now and then things that are exceptionable. All government includes some necessary hardness. General rules will bear hard on particular cases. This last maxim my father seemed to consider a settler in most alleged cases of cruelty. After he had said that, he commonly drew up his feet on the sofa, like a man that had disposed of a business, and betook himself to a nap, or the newspaper, as the case might be. The fact is, my father showed the exact sort of talent for a statesman. He could have divided Poland as easily as an orange, or trod on Ireland as quietly and systematically as any man living. At last my mother gave up in despair. It never will be known, till the last account, what noble and sensitive natures like hers have felt cast utterly helpless into what seems to them an abyss of injustice and cruelty, and which seems so to nobody about them. It has been an age of long sorrow of such natures, in such a hell-begotten sort of world as ours. What remained for her but to train her children in her own views and sentiments? Well, after all you say about training, children will grow up substantially what they are by nature, and only that. From the cradle Alfred was an aristocrat, and as he grew up, instinctively, all his sympathies and all his reasonings were in that line, and all mother's exhortations went to the winds. As to me, they sunk deep into me. She never contradicted in form anything my father said, or seemed directly to differ from him but she impressed, burnt into my very soul, with all the force of her deep earnest nature, an idea of the dignity and worth of the meanest human soul. I have looked in her face with solemn awe, when she would point up to the stars in the evening and say to me, "'See there, August, the poorest, meanest soul on our place will be living, when all these stars are gone for ever, will live as long as God lives.' She had some fine old paintings, one in particular, of Jesus healing a blind man. They were very fine, and used to impress me strongly. "'See there, August,' she would say, "'the blind man was a beggar, poor and loathsome. Therefore he would not heal him afar off. He called him to him, and put his hands on him. Remember this, my boy. If I had lived to grow up under her care, she might have stimulated me to I know not what of enthusiasm. I might have been a saint, reformer, martyr. But alas, alas, I went from her when I was only thirteen, and I never saw her again. St. Clair rested his head on his hands, and did not speak for some minutes. After a while he looked up and went on. What poor, mean trash this whole business of human virtue is! A mere matter, for the most part, of latitude and longitude, and geographical position, acting with natural temperament. The greater part is nothing but an accident. Your father, for example, settles in Vermont, in a town where all are, in fact, free and equal, becomes a regular church member and deacon, and in due time joins an abolition society, and thinks us all little better than heathens. Yet he is, for all the world, in constitution and habit, a duplicate of my father. I can see it leaking out in fifty different ways. Just the same strong, overbearing, dominant spirit. 
you know very well how impossible it is to persuade some of the folks in your village that Squire Sinclair does not feel above them. The fact is, though, he has fallen on democratic times, and embraced a democratic theory. He is to the heart an aristocrat, as much as my father, who ruled over five or six hundred slaves. Miss Ophelia felt rather disposed to cavil at this picture, and was laying down her knitting to begin, but St. Clair stopped her. Now, I know every word you are going to say. I do not say they were alike, in fact. One fell into a condition where everything acted against the natural tendency, and the other where everything acted for it. And so one turned out a pretty willful, stout, overbearing old democrat, and the other a willful, stout, old despot. If both had owned plantations in Louisiana, they would have been as alike as two old bullets cast in the same mould. "'What an undutiful boy you are!' said Miss Ophelia. "'I don't mean them any disrespect,' said St. Clair. "'You know reverence is not my forte. But to go back to my story. When father died he left the whole property to us twin boys, to be divided as we should agree. There does not breathe on God's earth a nobler-souled, more generous fellow than Alfred, in all that concerns his equals. And we got on admirably with this property question, without a single unbrotherly word or feeling. We undertook to work the plantation together, and Alfred, whose outward life and capabilities had double the strength of mine, became an enthusiastic planter, and a wonderfully successful one. But two years' trial satisfied me, and I could not be a partner in that matter. To have a great gang of seven hundred whom I could not know personally, or feel any individual interest in, bought and driven, housed, fed, worked like so many horned cattle, strained up to military precision, the question of how little of life's commonest enjoyments would keep them in working order being a constantly recurring problem, the necessity of drivers and overseers, the ever-necessary whip, first, last, and only argument, the whole thing was insufferably disgusting and loathsome to me, and when I thought of my mother's estimate of one poor human soul, it became even frightful. It's all nonsense to talk to me about slaves enjoying all this. To this day I have no patience with the unutterable trash that some of your patronizing northerners have made up, as in their zeal to apologize for our sins. We all know better. Tell me that any man living wants to work all his days, from day dawn till dark, under the constant eye of a master, without the power of putting forth one irresponsible volition on the same dreary, monotonous, unchanging toil, and all for two pairs of pantaloons and a pair of shoes a year, with enough food and shelter to keep him in working order. Any man who thinks that human beings can, as a general thing, be made about as comfortable that way as any other, I wish he might try it. I'd buy the dog, and work him, with a clear conscience." "'I always have supposed,' said Miss Ophelia, "'that you, all of you, approved of these things, and thought them right, according to Scripture.' "'Humbug! We are not quite reduced to that yet. Alfred, who is as determined a despot as ever walked, does not pretend to this kind of defence. No, he stands, high and haughty, on that good old respectable ground, the right of the strongest. And he says, and I think quite sensibly, that the American planter is only doing in another form what the English aristocracy and capitalists are doing by the lower classes. That is, I take it, appropriating them, body and bone, soul and spirit, to their use and convenience. He defends both, and I think at least consistently. He says that there can be no high civilization without enslavement of the masses, either nominal or real. There must, he says, be a lower class, given up to physical toil and confined to an animal nature, and a higher one thereby acquires leisure and wealth for a more expanded intelligence and improvement, and becomes the directing soul of the lower. So he reasons, because, as I said, he is born an aristocrat. So I don't believe, because I was born a democrat. "'How in the world can the two things be compared?' said Miss Ophelia. "'The English labourer is not sold, traded, parted from his family, whipped. He is as much at the will of his employer as if he were sold to him. The slave-owner can whip his refractory slave to death. The capitalist can starve him to death. 
As to family security, it is hard to say which is the worst, to have one's children sold, or see them starve to death at home. But it's no kind of apology for slavery, to prove that it isn't worse than some other bad thing. I didn't give it for one. Nay, I'll say, besides, that ours is the more bold and palpable infringement of human rights, actually buying a man up like a horse, looking at his teeth, cracking his joints, and trying his paces, and then paying down for him, having spectaculars, breeders, traders, and brokers in human bodies and souls, sets the thing before the eyes of the civilized world in a more tangible form, though the thing done be, after all, in its nature the same that is, appropriating one set of human beings to the use and improvement of another, without any regard to their own. "'I never thought of the matter in this light,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Well, I've travelled in England some, and I've looked over a good many documents as to the state of their lower classes, and I really think there is no denying Alfred when he says that his slaves are better off than a large class of the population of England. You see, you must not infer from what I have told you that Alfred is what is called a hard master, for he isn't. He is despotic, and unmerciful to insubordination. He would shoot a fellow down with as little remorse as he would shoot a buck, if he opposed him. But in general he takes a sort of pride in having his slaves comfortably fled and accommodated. When I was with him, I insisted that he should do something for their instruction, and to please me he did get a chaplain and used to have them catechized Sunday, though I believe in his heart that he thought it would do about as much good to set a chaplain over his dogs and horses. And the fact is that a mind stupefied and animalized by every bad influence from the hour of birth, spending the whole of every weekday in unreflecting toil, cannot be done much with by a few hours on Sunday. The teachers of Sunday schools among the manufacturing population of England, and among plantation hands in our country, could perhaps testify to the same result, there and here. Yet some striking exceptions there are among us, from the fact that the negro is naturally more impressible to religious sentiment than the white. "'Well,' said Miss Ophelia, "'how came you to give up your plantation life?' "'Well, we jogged on together some time, till Alfred saw plainly that I was no planter. He thought it absurd, after he had reformed and altered and improved everywhere to suit my notions, that I still remained unsatisfied. The fact was, it was, after all, the thing that I hated. The using these men and women, the perpetuation of all this ignorance, brutality, and vice, just to make money for me. Besides, I was always interfering in the details. Being myself one of the laziest of mortals, I had altogether too much fellow-feeling for the lazy and when poor shiftless dogs put stones at the bottom of their cotton baskets to make them weigh heavier, or filled their sacks with dirt, with cotton at the top, it seemed so exactly like what I should do if I were they, I couldn't and wouldn't have them flogged for it. Well, of course, there was an end of plantation discipline, and Alf and I came to about the same point that I and my respected father did years before. So he told me that I was a womanish sentimentalist and would never do for business life, and advised me to take the bank stock and the New Orleans family mansion, and go to writing poetry, and let him manage the plantation. So we parted, and I came here. But why didn't you free your slaves? Well, I wasn't up to that. To hold them as tools for money-making I could not. Have them to help spend money, you know, didn't look quite so ugly to me. Some of them were old house-servants, to whom I was much attached, and the younger ones were children to the old. All were well satisfied to be as they were." He paused, and walked reflectively up and down the room. "'There was,' said St. Clair, "'a time in my life when I had plans and hopes of doing something in this world more than to float and drift. I had vague, indistinct yearnings to be a sort of emancipator, to free my native land from this spot and stain. All young men have had such fever fits, I suppose, some time. But then— "'Why didn't you?' said Miss Ophelia. "'You ought not to put your hand to the plough and look back.' "'Oh, well, things didn't go with me as I expected, and I got the despair of living that Solomon did. I suppose it was a necessary incident to wisdom in us both. But, somehow or other, instead of being actor and regenerator in society, I became a piece of driftwood, and have been floating and eddying about ever since. 
Alfred scolds me every time we meet, and he has the better of me, I grant, for he really does something. His life is a logical result of his opinions, and mine is a contemptible non sequitur. My dear cousin, can you be satisfied with such a way of spending your probation? Satisfied? Was I not just telling you I despised it? But then, to come back to this point, we were on this liberation business. I don't think my feelings about slavery are peculiar. I find many men who, in their hearts, think of it just as I do. The land groans under it, and, bad as it is for the slave, it is worse, if anything, for the master. It takes no spectacles to see that a great class of vicious, improvident, degraded people among us are an evil to us, as well as to themselves. The capitalist and aristocrat of England cannot feel that as we do, because they do not mingle with the class they degrade as we do. They are in our homes, they are the associates of our children, and they form their minds faster than we can, for they are a race that children always will cling to and assimilate with. If Eva now was not more angel than ordinary, she would be ruined. We might as well allow the smallpox to run among them, and think our children would not take it as to let them be uninstructed and vicious, and think our children will not be affected by that. Yet our laws positively and utterly forbid any efficient general educational system, and they do it wisely, too, for just begin and thoroughly educate one generation, and the whole thing would be blown sky-high. If we did not give them liberty, they would take it." "'And what do you think will be the end of this?' said Miss Ophelia. "'I don't know. One thing is certain, that there is a mustering among the masses the world over, and there is a dies ire coming on sooner or later. The same thing is working in Europe, in England, and in this country. My mother used to tell me of a millennium that was coming, when Christ should reign and all men should be free and happy, and she taught me, when I was a boy, to pray, Thy kingdom come. Sometimes I think all this sighing and groaning and stirring among the dry bones foretells what she used to tell me was coming. But who may abide the day of his appearing? Augustine, sometimes I think you are not far from the kingdom, said Miss Ophelia, laying down her knitting and looking anxiously at her cousin. Thank you for your good opinion, but it's up and down with me, up to heaven's gate in theory, down in earth's dust in practice. But there's the tea-bell. Do let's go. And don't say now I haven't had one downright serious talk for once in my life." At table Marie alluded to the incident of Prue. "'I suppose you'll think, cousin,' she said, "'that we are all barbarians.' "'I think that's a barbarous thing,' said Miss Ophelia. "'But I don't think you are all barbarians.' "'Well, now,' said Marie. I know it's impossible to get along with some of these creatures. They are so bad they ought not to live. I don't feel a particle of sympathy for such cases. If they'd only behave themselves it would not happen." "'But, Mama," said Eva, "'the poor creature was unhappy. That's what made her drink.' "'Oh, fiddlestick! As if that were any excuse. I'm unhappy very often. I presume,' she said pensively, that I've had greater trials than ever she had. It's just because they are so bad. There's some of them that you cannot break in by any kind of severity. I remember father had a man that was so lazy he would run away just to get rid of work, and lie round in the swamps, stealing and doing all sorts of horrid things. That man was caught and whipped time and again, and it never did him any good. And the last time he crawled off, though he couldn't but just go, and died in the swamp, there was no sort of reason for it for father's hands were always treated kindly. "'I broke a fellow in once,' said St. Clair, "'that all the overseers and masters had tried their hands on in vain.' "'You?' said Marie. "'Well, I'd be glad to know when you ever did anything of the sort.' "'Well, he was a powerful, gigantic fellow, a native-born African, and he appeared to have the rude instinct of freedom in him to an uncommon degree. He was a regular African lion. They called him Scipio. Nobody could do anything with him, and he was sold round from overseer to overseer, till at last Alfred bought him, because he thought he could manage him. Well, one day he knocked down the overseer, and was fairly off into the swamps. I was on a visit to Alf's plantation, for it was after we had dissolved partnership. Alfred was greatly exasperated. 
but I told him that it was his own fault, and laid him any wager that I could break the man, and finally it was agreed that, if I caught him, I should have him to experiment on. So they mustered out a party of some six or seven with guns and dogs for the hunt. People, you know, can get up as much enthusiasm in hunting a man as a deer, if it is only customary. In fact, I got a little excited myself, though I had only put in as a sort of mediator in case he was caught. Well, the dogs bayed and howled, and we rode and scampered, and finally we started him. He ran and bounded like a buck, and kept us well in the rear for some time. But at last he got caught in an impenetrable thicket of cane. Then he turned to bay, and I tell you he fought the dogs right gallantly. He dashed them to right and left, and actually killed three of them with only his naked fist when a shot from a gun brought him down, and he fell, wounded and bleeding, almost at my feet. The poor fellow looked up at me with manhood and despair both in his eye. I kept back the dogs and the party, as they came pressing up, and claimed him as my prisoner. It was all I could do to keep them from shooting him in the flush of success, but I persisted in my bargain, and Alfred sold him to me. Well, I took him in hand, and in one fortnight I had him tamed down as submissive and tractable as heart could desire. "'What in the world did you do to him?' said Marie. Well, it was quite a simple process. I took him to my own room, had a good bed made for him, dressed his wounds, and tended him myself until he got fairly on his feet again, and, in process of time, I had free papers made out for him, and told him he might go where he liked. "'And did he go?' said Miss Ophelia. "'No. The foolish fellow tore the paper in two, and absolutely refused to leave me. I never had a braver, better fellow, trusty and true as steel. He embraced Christianity afterwards, and became as gentle as a child. He used to oversee my place on the lake, and did it capitally, too. I lost him the first cholera season. In fact, he laid down his life for me, for I was sick almost to death, and when, through the panic, everybody else fled, Scipio worked for me like a giant, and actually brought me back into life again. But, poor fellow, he was taken, right after, and there was no saving him. I never felt anybody's loss more. Eva had come gradually nearer and nearer to her father, as he told the story, her small lips apart, her eyes wide and earnest with absorbing interest. As he finished, she suddenly threw her arms around his neck, burst into tears, and sobbed convulsively. "'Eva, dear child, what is the matter?' said St. Clair, as the child's small frame trembled and shook with the violence of her feelings. "'This child,' he added, "'ought not to hear any of this kind of thing. She's nervous.' "'No, papa, I'm not nervous,' said Eva, controlling herself suddenly, with a strength of resolution singular in such a child. "'I'm not nervous, but these things sink into my heart.' "'What do you mean, Eva?' "'I can't tell you, papa. I think a great many thoughts. Perhaps some day I shall tell you.' "'Well, think away, dear. Only don't cry and worry your papa,' said St. Clair. "'Look here. See what a beautiful peach I have got for you.' Eva took it and smiled though there was still a nervous twitching about the corners of her mouth. "'Come, look at the goldfish,' said St. Clair, taking her hand and stepping on to the veranda. A few moments, and merry laughs were heard through the silken curtains, as Eva and St. Clair were pelting each other with roses, and chasing each other among the alleys of the court. "'There is danger that our humble friend Tom be neglected amid the adventures of the higher-born, but if our readers will accompany us up to a little loft over the stable, they may perhaps learn a little of his affairs. It was a decent room, containing a bed, a chair, and a small rough stand, where lay Tom's Bible and hymn-book, and where he sits at present, with his slate before him, intent on something that seems to cost him a great deal of anxious thought. The fact was that Tom's home yearnings had become so strong that he had begged a sheet of writing-paper of Eva, and, mustering up all his small stock of literary attainment acquired by Master George's instructions, he conceived the bold idea of writing a letter, and he was busy now, on his slate, getting out his first draft. Tom was in a good deal of trouble, for the forms of some of the letters he had forgotten entirely and of what he did remember he did not know exactly what to use. And while he was working, and breathing very hard in his earnestness, 
Eva alighted, like a bird, on the round of his chair behind him, and peeped over his shoulder. "'Oh, Uncle Tom, what funny things you are making there!' "'I'm trying to write to my poor old woman, Miss Eva, and my little children,' said Tom, drawing the back of his hand over his eyes. "'But somehow I'm feared I shan't make it out.' "'I wish I could help you, Tom. I've learned to write some. Last year I could make all the letters, but I'm afraid I've forgotten.' So Eva put her golden head close to his, and the two commenced a grave and anxious discussion, each one equally earnest, and about equally ignorant. And with a deal of consulting and advising over every word, the composition began, as they both felt very sanguine, to look quite like writing. "'Yes, Uncle Tom, it really begins to look beautiful,' said Eva, gazing delightedly on it. "'How pleased your wife will be, and the poor little children! Oh, it's a shame you ever had to go away from them. I mean to ask Papa to let you go back some time.' "'Mrs. said that she would send down money for me as soon as they could get it together,' said Tom. "'I'm specting she will. Young Massa George, he said he'd come for me, and he gave me this yer dollar as a sign.' and Tom drew from under his clothes the precious dollar. "'Oh, he'll certainly come, then,' said Eva. "'I'm so glad.' "'And I wanted to send a letter, you know, to let him know where I was, and tell poor Chloe that I was well off, cause she felt so dreadful, poor soul.' "'I say, Tom,' said St. Clair's voice, coming in the door at this moment. Tom and Eva both started. "'What's here?' said St. Clair, coming up and looking at the slate. "'Oh, it's Tom's letter. I'm helping him to write it,' said Eva. "'Isn't it nice?' "'I wouldn't discourage either of you,' said St. Clair. "'But I rather think, Tom, you'd better get me to write your letter for you. I'll do it when I come home from my ride.' "'It's very important he should write,' said Eva. "'Because his mistress is going to send down money to redeem him, you know, Papa. He told me they told him so.' St. Clair thought, in his heart, that this was probably only one of those things which good-natured owners say to their servants, to alleviate their horror of being sold, without any intention of fulfilling the expectation thus excited. But he did not make any audible comment upon it, only ordered Tom to get the horses out for a ride. Tom's letter was written in due form for him that evening, and safely lodged in the post-office. Miss Ophelia still persevered in her labors in the housekeeping line. It was universally agreed among all the household, from Dinah down to the youngest urchin, that Miss Ophelia was decidedly curious, a term by which a southern servant implies that his or her betters don't exactly suit them. The higher circle in the family, to wit Adolph, Jane, and Rosa, agreed that she was no lady. Ladies never keep working about as she did. That she had no air at all and they were surprised that she should be any relation of the St. Clair's. Even Marie declared that it was absolutely fatiguing to see Cousin Ophelia always so busy. And, in fact, Miss Ophelia's industry was so incessant as to lay some foundation for the complaint. She sewed and stitched away from daylight till dark, with the energy of one who is pressed on by some immediate urgency, and then, when the light faded, and the work was folded away, with one turn-out came the ever-ready knitting-work, and there she was again, going on as briskly as ever. It really was a labor to see her. End of chapter 19 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 20 Topsy one morning, while Miss Ophelia was busy in some of her domestic cares, St. Clair's voice was heard, calling her at the foot of the stairs. "'Come down here, cousin. I've something to show you.' "'What is it?' said Miss Ophelia, coming down with her sewing in her hand. "'I've made a purchase for your department. See here,' said St. Clair, and with that word he pulled along a little negro girl about eight or nine years of age. She was one of the blackest of her race, and her round, shining eyes, glittering as glass beads, moved with quick and restless glances over everything in the room. Her mouth, half open with astonishment at the wonders of the new master's parlor, displayed a white and brilliant set of teeth. Her woolly hair was braided in sundry little tails, which stuck out in every direction. 
The expression of her face was an odd mixture of shrewdness and cunning, over which was oddly drawn, like a kind of veil, an expression of the most doleful gravity and solemnity. She was dressed in a single filthy ragged garment made of bagging, and stood with her hands demurely folded before her. Altogether there was something odd and goblin-like about her appearance, something, as Miss Ophelia afterwards said, so heathenish as to inspire that good lady with utter dismay, and turning to St. Clair she said, "'Augustine, what in the world have you brought that thing here for?' "'For you to educate, to be sure, and train in the way she should go. I thought she was rather a funny specimen in the Jim Crow line. Here, Topsy,' he added, giving a whistle, as a man would to call the attention of a dog, "'give us a song now, and show us some of your dancing.' The black, glassy eyes glittered with a kind of wicked drollery, and the thing struck up, in a clear, shrill voice, an odd negro melody, to which she kept time with her hands and feet, spinning round, clapping her hands, knocking her knees together in a wild, fantastic sort of time, and producing in her throat all those odd guttural sounds which distinguish the native music of her race. And finally, turning a somerset or two, and giving a prolonged closing note, as odd and unearthly as that of a steam-whistle, she came suddenly down on the carpet, and stood with her hands folded, and a most sanctimonious expression of meekness and solemnity over her face, only broken by the cunning glances which she shot askance from the corners of her eyes. Miss Ophelia stood silent, perfectly paralyzed with amazement. St. Clair, like a mischievous fellow as he was, appeared to enjoy her astonishment, and, addressing the child again, said, "'Topsy, this is your new mistress. I'm going to give you up to her. See now that you behave yourself.' "'Yes, Massa,' said Topsy, with sanctimonious gravity, her wicked eyes twinkling as she spoke. "'You're going to be good, Topsy, you understand?' said St. Clair. "'Oh, yes, Massa,' said Topsy, with another twinkle, her hand still devoutly folded. "'Now, Augustine, what upon earth is this for?' said Miss Ophelia. "'Your house is so full of these little plagues now that a body can't set down their foot without treading on them. I get up in the morning and find one asleep behind the door, and see one black head poking out from under the table, one lying on the doormat, and they are moping and mowing and grinning between all the railings and tumbling over the kitchen floor. What on earth did you want to bring this one for?' for you to educate, didn't I tell you? You're always preaching about educating. I thought I would make you a present of a fresh-caught specimen, and let you try your hand on her, and bring her up in the way she should go." "'I don't want her, I am sure. I have more to do with them now than I want to. That's you Christians all over. You'll get up a society, and get some poor missionary to spend all his days among just such heathen. But let me see one of you that would take one into your house with you, and take the labor of their conversion on yourselves. No, when it comes to that they are dirty and disagreeable, and it's too much care, and so on. Augustine, you know I didn't think of it in that light," said Miss Ophelia, evidently softening. Well, it might be a real missionary work," said she, looking rather more favorably on the child. St. Clair had touched the right string. Miss Ophelia's conscientiousness was ever on the alert. But, she added, I really didn't see the need of buying this one. There are enough now in your house to take all my time and skill. Well, then, cousin, said St. Clair, drawing her aside, I ought to beg your pardon for my good-for-nothing speeches. You are so good, after all, that there's no sense in them. Why, the fact is, this concern belonged to a couple of drunken creatures that keep a low restaurant that I have to pass by every day, and I was tired of hearing her screaming and them beating and swearing at her. She looked bright and funny, too, as if something might be made of her. So I bought her, and I'll give her to you. Try now, and give her a good orthodox New England bringing up, and see what it'll make of her. You know I haven't any gift that way, but I'd like you to try." "'Well, I'll do what I can,' said Miss Ophelia. And she approached her new subject very much as a person might be supposed to approach a black spider supposing them to have benevolent designs toward it. "'She's dreadfully dirty and half-naked,' she said. "'Well, take her downstairs, and make some of them clean and clothe her up.' Miss Ophelia carried her to the kitchen regions. 
don't see what Massa and St. Clair wants of another nigger," said Dinah, surveying the new arrival with no friendly air. "'Won't have her round under my feet, I know.' "'Pah!' said Rosa and Jane, with supreme disgust. "'Let her keep out of our way. What in the world masses want another of these low niggers for? I can't see.' "'You go long. No more nigger than you be, Miss Rosa,' said Dinah, who felt this last remark a reflection on herself. "'You seem to think yourself white folks. You ain't ne'er one black nor white. I'd like to be one or t'other." Miss Ophelia saw that there was nobody in the camp that would undertake to oversee the cleansing and dressing of the new arrival, and so she was forced to do it herself, with some very ungracious and reluctant assistance from Jane. It is not for ears polite to hear the particulars of the first toilet of a neglected, abused child. In fact, in this world, multitudes must live and die in a state that it would be too great a shock to the nerves of their fellow-mortals even to hear described. Miss Ophelia had a good, strong, practical deal of resolution, and she went through all the disgusting details with heroic thoroughness, though it must be confessed with no very gracious air for endurance was the utmost to which her principles could bring her. When she saw, on the back and shoulders of the child, great welts and calloused spots, ineffaceable marks of the system under which she had grown up thus far, her heart became pitiful within her. "'See there,' said Jane, pointing to the marks. "'Don't that show she's a limb? We'll have fine works with her, I reckon. I hate these nigger young'uns. So disgusting!' I wonder that Massa would buy her." The young un alluded to heard all these comments with a subdued and doleful air which seemed habitual to her, only scanning, with a keen and furtive glance of her flickering eyes, the ornaments which Jane wore in her ears. When arrayed at last in a suit of decent and whole clothing, her hair cropped short to her head, Miss Ophelia, with some satisfaction, said, "'She looked more Christian-like than she did.' and in her own mind began to mature some plans for her instruction. Sitting down before her, she began to question her. "'How old are you, Topsy?' "'Dunno, missus,' said the image, with a grin that showed all her teeth. "'Don't know how old you are. Didn't anybody ever tell you? Who was your mother?' "'Never had none,' said the child, with another grin. "'Never had any mother? What do you mean? Where were you born?' "'Never was born,' persisted Topsy, with another grin, that looked so goblin-like that, if Miss Ophelia had been at all nervous, she might have fancied that she had got hold of some sooty gnome from the land of diablerie. But Miss Ophelia was not nervous, but plain and businesslike, and she said, with some sternness, "'You mustn't answer me in that way, child. I'm not playing with you. Tell me where you were born, and who your father and mother were.' "'Never was born,' reiterated the creature, more emphatically. "'Never had no father, nor mother, nor nothin'. I was raised by a speculator, with lots of others. Old Aunt Sue used to take care on us.' The child was evidently sincere, and Jane, breaking into a short laugh, said, "'Laws, missus, there's heaps of em. Speculators buys em up cheap, when day's little, and gets em raised for market. How long have you lived with your master and mistress?' "'Don't know, missus.' Is it a year, or more, or less?" "'Don't know, missus." "'Laws, missus, those low negroes, they can't tell. They don't know anything about time,' said Jane. "'They don't know what a year is. They don't know their own ages.' "'Have you ever heard anything about God, Topsy?' The child looked bewildered, but grinned as usual. "'Do you know who made you?' "'Nobody as I knows on,' said the child, with a short laugh. The idea appeared to amuse her considerably, for her eyes twinkled, and she added, "'I spect I'd growed. Don't think nobody never made me.' "'Do you know how to sew?' said Ophelia, who thought she would turn her inquiries to something more tangible. "'No, missus. What can you do? What did you do for your master and mistress?' "'Fetch water, and wash dishes, and rub knives, and wait on folks. Were they good to you?' "'Speck they was,' said the child, scanning Miss Ophelia cunningly. Miss Ophelia rose from this encouraging colloquy. St. Clair was leaning over the back of her chair. "'You find virgin soil there, cousin. Put in your own ideas. You won't find many to pull up.' 
Miss Ophelia's ideas of education, like all her other ideas, were very set and definite, and of the kind that prevailed in New England a century ago, and which are still preserved in some very retired and unsophisticated parts, where there are no railroads. As nearly as could be expressed, they could be comprised in very few words, to teach them to mind when they were spoken to, to teach them the catechism, sewing and reading, and to whip them if they told lies. And though, of course, in the flood of light that is now poured on education, these are left far away in the rear, yet it is an undisputed fact that our grandmothers raised some tolerably fair men and women under this regime, as many of us can remember and testify. At all events, Miss Ophelia knew of nothing else to do, and therefore applied her mind to her heathen with the best diligence she could command. The child was announced and considered in the family as Miss Ophelia's girl, and, as she was looked upon with no gracious eye in the kitchen, Miss Ophelia resolved to confine her sphere of operation and instruction chiefly to her own chamber. With a self-sacrifice which some of our readers will appreciate, she resolved, instead of comfortably making her own bed, sweeping and dusting her own chamber, which she had hitherto done, in utter scorn of all offers of help from the chambermaid of the establishment, to condemn herself to the martyrdom of instructing Topsy to perform these operations. Ah, woe the day! Did any of our readers ever do the same, they will appreciate the amount of her self-sacrifice. Miss Ophelia began with Topsy, by taking her into her chamber the first morning, and solemnly commencing a course of instruction in the art and mystery of bed-making. Behold, then, Topsy, washed and shorn of all the little braided tails wherein her heart had delighted, arrayed in a clean gown, with well-starched apron, standing reverently before Miss Ophelia, with an expression of solemnity well befitting a funeral. "'Now, Topsy, I'm going to show you just how my bed is to be made. I am very particular about my bed. You must learn exactly how to do it.' "'Yes, ma'am,' said Topsy, with a deep sigh and a face of woeful earnestness. "'Now, Topsy, look here. This is the hem of the sheet. This is the right side of the sheet, and this is the wrong. Will you remember?' "'Yes, ma'am,' said Topsy, with another sigh. "'Well, now, the under-sheet you must bring over the bolster, so, and tuck it clear down under the mattress nice and smooth, so. Do you see?' "'Yes, ma'am,' said Topsy, with profound attention. "'But the upper sheet,' said Miss Ophelia, "'must be brought down in this way, and tucked under firm and smooth at the foot. So. The narrow hem at the foot.' "'Yes, ma'am,' said Topsy, as before. But we will add, what Miss Ophelia did not see, that during the time when the good lady's back was turned in the zeal of her manipulations, the young disciple had contrived to snatch a pair of gloves and a ribbon, which she had adroitly slipped into her sleeves, and stood with her hands dutifully folded as before. "'Now, Topsy, let's see you do this,' said Miss Ophelia, pulling off the clothes and seating herself. Topsy, with great gravity and adroitness, went through the exercise completely to Miss Ophelia's satisfaction, smoothing the sheets, patting out every wrinkle, and exhibiting through the whole process a gravity and seriousness with which her instructress was greatly edified. By an unlucky slip, however, a fluttering fragment of the ribbon hung out of one of her sleeves, just as she was finishing, and caught Miss Ophelia's attention. Instantly she pounced upon it. "'What's this? You naughty, wicked child! You've been stealing this!' The ribbon was pulled out of Topsy's own sleeve, yet was she not in the least disconcerted. She only looked at it with an air of the most surprised and unconscious innocence. "'Laws! Why, that ars Miss Feely's ribbon, ain't it? How could it a got caught in my sleeve?' "'Topsy, you naughty girl, don't you tell me a lie. You stole that ribbon.' "'Missus, I declare for it, I didn't. Never seed it till this yeah, blessed minute.' "'Topsy,' said Miss Ophelia, "'don't you know it's wicked to tell lies?' "'I never tell no lies, Miss Feely,' said Topsy, with virtuous gravity. "'It's just the truth I've been a-tellin' now, and ain't nothin' else.' "'Topsy, I shall have to whip you if you tell lies so.' "'Laws, missus, if you's to whip all day, couldn't say no other way,' said Topsy, beginning to blubber. "'I never see that I. It must have got a caught in my sleeve. Miss Feely must have left it on the bed, and it got caught in the clothes, and so got in my sleeve.' 
Miss Ophelia was so indignant at the bare-faced lie that she caught the child and shook her. "'Don't you tell me that again!' The shake brought the glove on the floor from the other sleeve. "'There, you!' said Miss Ophelia. "'Will you tell me now? You didn't steal the ribbons?' Topsy now confessed to the gloves, but still persisted in denying the ribbon. "'Now, Topsy,' said Miss Ophelia, "'if you'll confess all about it, I won't whip you this time.' Thus adjured, Topsy confessed to the ribbon and gloves, with woeful protestations of penitence. "'Well, now tell me. I know you must have taken other things since you have been in the house, for I let you run about all day yesterday. Now tell me if you took anything, and I shan't whip you.' "'Laws, missus, I took Miss Eva's red thing she wires on her neck.' "'You did, you naughty child. Well, what else?' "'I took Rosa's ear-rings, them red ones. Go bring them to me this minute, both of them.' "'Laws, missus, I can't. They's burnt up.' "'Burnt up? What a story! Go get em, or I'll whip you.' Topsy, with loud protestations and tears and groans, declared that she could not. "'They's burnt up! They was!' "'What did you burn em for?' said Miss Ophelia. "'Cause I's wicked, I is. I's mighty wicked, anyhow. I can't help it.' Just at this moment Eva came innocently into the room with the identical coral necklace on her neck. "'Why, Eva, where did you get your necklace?' said Miss Ophelia. "'Get it? Why, I've had it on all day,' said Eva. "'Did you have it on yesterday?' "'Yes. And what is funny, Auntie? I had it on all night. I forgot to take it off when I went to bed." Miss Ophelia looked perfectly bewildered, the more so as Rosa at that instant came into the room with a basket of newly ironed linen poised on her head, and the coral ear-drops shaking in her ears. "'I'm sure I can't tell anything what to do with such a child,' she said in despair. "'What in the world did you tell me you took those things for, Topsy? Why, Missus said I must fess and I couldn't think of nothing else to fess," said Topsy, rubbing her eyes. "'But, of course, I didn't want you to confess things you didn't do,' said Miss Ophelia. "'That's telling a lie just as much as the other.' "'Laws, now, is it?' said Topsy, with an air of innocent wonder. "'La! Nah, there ain't any such thing as truth in that limb,' said Rosa, looking indignantly at Topsy. "'If I was Master St. Clair, I'd whip her till the blood run, I would. I'd let her catch it.' "'No, no, Rosa,' said Eva, with an air of command, which the child could assume at times. "'You mustn't talk so, Rosa. I can't bear to hear it.' "'La sakes, Miss Eva! You so good, you don't know nothing how to get along with niggers. There's no way but to cut em well up, I tell you.' "'Rosa,' said Eva, "'hush! Don't you say another word of that sort.' And the eye of the child flashed, and her cheek deepened its color. Rosa was cowed in a moment. "'Miss Eva has got the St. Clair blood in her, that's plain. She can speak for all the world just like her papa,' she said as she passed out of the room. Eva stood looking at Topsy. There stood the two children representatives of the two extremes of society. The fair, high-bred child with her golden head, her deep eyes, her spiritual noble brow, and prince-like movements and her black, keen, subtle, cringing, yet acute neighbor. They stood the representatives of their races, the Saxon, born of ages of cultivation, command, education, physical and moral eminence, and the Afric, born of ages of oppression, submission, ignorance, toil, and vice. Something, perhaps, of such thoughts struggled through Eva's mind, but a child's thoughts are rather dim, undefined instincts, and in Eva's noble nature many such were yearning and working, for which she had no power of utterance. When Miss Ophelia expatiated on Topsy's naughty, wicked conduct, the child looked perplexed and sorrowful, but said sweetly, "'Poor Topsy! Why need you steal? You're going to be taken good care of now. I'm sure I'd rather give you anything of mine than have you steal it.' It was the first word of kindness the child had ever heard in her life. And the sweet tone and manner struck strangely on the wide, rude heart, and a sparkle of something like a tear shone in the keen, round, glittering eye. But it was followed by the short laugh and habitual grin. No, the ear that has never heard anything but abuse is strangely incredulous of anything so heavenly as kindness. 
and Topsy only thought Eva's speech something funny and inexplicable. She did not believe it. But what was to be done with Topsy? Miss Ophelia found the case a puzzler. Her rules for bringing up didn't seem to apply. She thought she would take time to think of it, and, by the way of gaining time, and in hopes of some indefinite moral virtues supposed to be inherent in dark closets, Miss Ophelia shut Topsy up in one till she had arranged her ideas further on the subject. "'I don't see,' said Miss Ophelia to St. Clair, "'how I'm going to manage that child without whipping her.' "'Well, whip her, then, to your heart's content. I'll give you full power to do what you like.' "'Children always have to be whipped,' said Miss Ophelia. "'I never heard of bringing them up without.' "'Oh, well, certainly,' said St. Clair. "'Do as you think best. Only I'll make one suggestion. I've seen this child whipped with a poker, knocked down with a shovel or tongs, whichever came handiest, etc., and seeing that she is used to that style of operation, I think your whippings will have to be pretty energetic to make much impression. "'What is to be done with her, then?' said Miss Ophelia. "'You have started a serious question,' said St. Clair. "'I wish you'd answer it. What is to be done with a human being that can be governed only by the lash? That fails. It's a very common state of things down here.' "'I'm sure I don't know. I never saw such a child as this.' "'Such children are very common among us, and such men and women, too. How are they to be governed?' said St. Clair. "'I'm sure it's more than I can say,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Or I, either,' said St. Clair. "'The horrid cruelties and outrages that once in a while find their way into the papers, such cases as Prue's, for example, what do they come from? In many cases it is a gradual hardening process on both sides, the owner growing more and more cruel, as the servant more and more callous. Whipping and abuse are like laudanum. You have to double the dose as the sensibilities decline. I saw this very early when I became an owner, and I resolved never to begin, because I did not know when I should stop, and I resolved at least to protect my own moral nature. The consequence is that my servants act like spoiled children, but I think that better than for us both to be brutalized together. You have talked a great deal about our responsibilities in educating, cousin. I really wanted you to try with one child who is a specimen of thousands among us. "'It is your system makes such children,' said Miss Ophelia. "'I know it. But they are made. They exist. And what is to be done with them?' "'Well, I can't say I thank you for the experiment. But then, as it appears to be a duty, I shall persevere and try, and do the best I can,' said Miss Ophelia. And Miss Ophelia, after this, did labor with a commendable degree of zeal and energy on her new subject. She instituted regular hours and employments for her, and undertook to teach her to read and sew. In the former art the child was quick enough. She learned her letters as if by magic, and was very soon able to read plain reading. But the sewing was a more difficult matter. The creature was as lithe as a cat, and as active as a monkey and the confinement of sewing was her abomination. So she broke her needles, threw them slyly out of the window, or down in chinks of the walls. She tangled, broke, and dirtied her thread, or, with a sly movement, would throw a spool away altogether. Her motions were almost as quick as those of a practiced conjurer, and her command of her face quite as great, and though Miss Ophelia could not help feeling that so many accidents could not possibly happen in succession, Yet she could not, without a watchfulness which would leave her no time for anything else, detect her. Topsy was soon a noted character in the establishment. Her talent for every species of drollery, grimace, and mimicry, for dancing, tumbling, climbing, singing, whistling, imitating every sound that hit her fancy, seemed inexhaustible. In her play hours she invariably had every child in the establishment at her heels open-mouthed with admiration and wonder, not excepting Miss Eva, who appeared to be fascinated by her wild diablerie, as a dove is sometimes charmed by a glittering serpent. Miss Ophelia was uneasy that Eva should fancy Topsy's society so much, and implored St. Clair to forbid it. "'Pooh! Let the child alone,' said St. Clair. "'Topsy will do her good.' "'But so depraved a child! Are you not afraid she will teach her some mischief?' She can't teach her mischief. 
She might teach it to some children, but evil rolls off Eva's mind like dew off a cabbage leaf. Not a drop sinks in. "'Don't be too sure,' said Miss Ophelia. "'I know I'd never let a child of mine play with Topsy.' "'Well, your children needn't,' said St. Clair. "'But mine may. If Eva could have been spoiled, it would have been done years ago.' Topsy was at first despised and contemned by the upper servants. They soon found reason to alter their opinion. It was very soon discovered that whoever cast an indignity on Topsy was sure to meet with some inconvenient accident shortly after. Either a pair of earrings or some cherished trinket would be missing, or an article of dress would be suddenly found utterly ruined, or the person would stumble accidentally into a pail of hot water, or a libation of dirty slop would unaccountably deluge them from above when in full gala dress. And on all these occasions, when investigation was made, there was nobody found to stand sponsor for the indignity. Topsy was cited, and had up before all the domestic judicatories, time and again, but always sustained her examinations with most edifying innocence and gravity of appearance. Nobody in the world ever doubted who did the things, but not a scrap of any direct evidence could be found to establish the suppositions, and Miss Ophelia was too just to feel at liberty to proceed to any length without it. The mischiefs done were always so nicely timed, also, as further to shelter the aggressor. Thus the times for revenge on Rosa and Jane, the two chambermaids, were always chosen in those seasons when, as not unfrequently happened, they were in disgrace with their mistress, when any complaint from them would of course meet with no sympathy. In short, Topsy soon made the household understand the propriety of letting her alone, and she was let alone accordingly. Topsy was smart and energetic in all manual operations, learning everything that was taught her with surprising quickness. With a few lessons she had learned to do the proprieties of Miss Ophelia's chamber in a way with which even that particular lady could find no fault. Mortal hands could not lay spread smoother adjust pillows more accurately, sweep and dust and arrange more perfectly than Topsy when she chose, but she didn't very often choose. If Miss Ophelia, after three or four days of careful patient supervision, was so sanguine as to suppose that Topsy had at last fallen into her way, could do without overlooking, and so go off and busy herself about something else. Topsy would hold a perfect carnival of confusion for some one or two hours. Instead of making the bed, she would amuse herself with pulling off the pillowcases, butting her woolly head among the pillows, till it would sometimes be grotesquely ornamented with feathers sticking out in various directions. She would climb the posts, and hang head downward from the tops, flourish the sheets and spreads all over the apartment, dress the bolster up in Miss Ophelia's nightclothes, and enact various performances with that, singing and whistling and making grimaces at herself in the looking-glass. In short, as Miss Ophelia phrased it, raising Cain generally. On one occasion Miss Ophelia found Topsy with her very best scarlet India Canton crepe shawl wound round her head for a turban, going on with her rehearsals before the glass in great style, Miss Ophelia having, with carelessness most unheard of in her, left the key for once in her drawer. "'Topsy!' she would say, when, at the end of all patience, "'what does make you act so?' "'Dunno, missus. I spec cause I so wicked. I don't know anything what I shall do with you, Topsy. Law, missus, you must whip me. My old missus allers whip me. I ain't used to work unless I gets whipped. Why, Topsy, I don't want to whip you. You can do well, if you've a mind to. What is the reason you won't? Laws, missus, I used to whippin'. I spets it's good for me. Miss Ophelia tried the recipe and Topsy invariably made a terrible commotion, screaming, groaning, and imploring, though half an hour afterwards, when roosted on some projection of the balcony, and surrounded by a flock of admiring young'uns, she would express the utmost contempt of the whole affair. "'La, Miss Feely Whip! Wouldn't kill a skeeter, her whippins. Oughter see how old Master made the flesh fly. Old Master knowed how!' Topsy always made great capital of her own sins and enormities, evidently considering them as something peculiarly distinguishing. "'Law, you niggers,' she would say to some of her auditors, "'does you know you's all sinners? Well, you is. Everybody is. White folks is sinners, too. Miss Feely says so. But I specs niggers is the biggest ones. But, law, you ain't any on you up to me. I's so awful wicked. 
There can't nobody do nothing with me. I used to keep old missus as swearing at me half the time. I spect I's the wickedest critter in the world." And Topsy would cut a somerset and come up brusque and shining on a higher perch, and evidently plume herself on the distinction. Miss Ophelia busied herself very earnestly on Sundays, teaching Topsy the catechism. Topsy had an uncommon verbal memory, and committed with a fluency that greatly encouraged her instructress. "'What good do you expect it is going to do her?' said St. Clair. "'Why, it always has done children good. It's what children always have to learn, you know,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Understand it or not,' said St. Clair. "'Oh, children never understand it at the time. But after they are grown up, it'll come to them.' "'Mine hasn't come to me yet,' said St. Clair, "'though I'll bear testimony that you put it into me pretty thoroughly when I was a boy. "'Ah, you were always good at learning, Augustine. I used to have great hopes of you,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Well, haven't you now?' said St. Clair. "'I wish you were as good as you were when you were a boy, Augustine.' "'So do I. That's a fact, cousin,' said St. Clair. "'Well, go ahead and catechize, Topsy. Maybe you'll make out something yet.' Topsy, who had stood like a black statue during this discussion, with hands decently folded, now at a signal from Miss Ophelia went on, "'Our first parents, being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the state wherein they were created.' Topsy's eyes twinkled, and she looked inquiringly. "'What is it, Topsy?' said Miss Ophelia. "'Please, Missus, was that our state, Kentuck?' "'What state, Topsy?' "'That state they fell out of.' I used to hear Massa tell how we came down from Kentuck. St. Clair laughed. "'You'll have to give her a meaning, or she'll make one,' said he. "'There seems to be a theory of emigration suggested there.' "'Oh, Augustine, be still,' said Miss Ophelia. "'How can I do anything if you will be laughing?' "'Well, I won't disturb the exercises again, on my honor. And St. Clair took his paper into the parlor and sat down, till Topsy had finished her recitations. They were all very well, only that now and then she would oddly transpose some important words, and persist in the mistake, in spite of every effort to the contrary. And St. Clair, after all his promises of goodness, took a wicked pleasure in these mistakes, calling Topsy to him whenever he had a mind to amuse himself, and getting her to repeat the offending passages, in spite of Miss Ophelia's remonstrances. "'How do you think I can do anything with the child if you will go on so, Augustine?' she would say. Well, it is too bad. I won't again. But I do like to hear the droll little image stumble over those big words. But you confirm her in the wrong way. What's the odds? One word is as good as another to her. You wanted me to bring her up right, and you ought to remember she is a reasonable creature, and be careful of your influence over her. Oh, dismal! So I ought. But as Topsy herself says, as so wicked! In very much this way Topsy's training proceeded, for a year or two, Miss Ophelia worrying herself from day to day with her as a kind of chronic plague, to whose inflictions she became, in time, as accustomed, as persons sometimes do to the neuralgia or sick headache. St. Clair took the same kind of amusement in the child that a man might in the tricks of a parrot or a pointer. Topsy, whenever her sins brought her into disgrace in other quarters, always took refuge behind his chair, and St. Clair, in one way or other, would make peace for her. From him she got many a stray picayune, which she laid out in nuts and candies, and distributed with careless generosity to all the children in the family. For Topsy, to do her justice, was good-natured and liberal, and only spiteful in self-defense. She is fairly introduced into our corps de ballet, and will figure, from time to time in her turn, with other performers. End of chapter 20 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 21 Kentuck Our readers may not be unwilling to glance back, for a brief interval, at Uncle Tom's Cabin on the Kentucky farm, and see what has been transpiring among those whom he had left behind. It was late in the summer afternoon, and the doors and windows of the large parlor all stood open to invite any stray breeze that might feel in good humor to enter. 
Mr. Shelby sat in a large hall, opening into the room, and running through the whole length of the house to a balcony on either end. Leisurely tipped back on one chair, with his heels in another, he was enjoying his after-dinner cigar. Mrs. Shelby sat at the door, busy about some fine sewing. She seemed like one who had something on her mind, which she was seeking an opportunity to introduce. "'Do you know,' she said, "'that Chloe has had a letter from Tom?' "'Ah, has she? Tom's got some friends there, it seems. How is the old boy?' "'He has been bought by a very fine family, I should think,' said Mrs. Shelby. "'He's kindly treated, and has not much to do.' "'Ah, well, I'm glad of it. Very glad,' said Mr. Shelby, heartily. "'Tom, I suppose, will get reconciled to a southern residence. Hardly want to come up here again.' "'On the contrary, he inquires very anxiously,' said Mrs. Shelby, "'when the money for his redemption is to be raised.' "'I'm sure I don't know,' said Mr. Shelby. "'Once get business running wrong, there does seem to be no end to it. It's like jumping from one bog to another, all through a swamp.' borrow one to pay another, and then borrow of another to pay one, and these confounded notes falling due before a man has time to smoke a cigar and turn around. Dunning letters and dunning messages, all scamper and hurry-scurry. It does seem to me, my dear, that something might be done to straighten matters. Suppose we sell off all the horses, and sell one of your farms, and pay up square. Oh, ridiculous, Emily! You are the finest woman in Kentucky, but still you haven't sense to know that you don't understand business. Women never do, and never can." "'But at least,' said Mrs. Shelby, "'could not you give me some little insight into yours? A list of all your debts, at least, and of all that is owed to you. And let me try and see if I can help you to economize." "'Oh, bother! Don't plague me, Emily. I can't tell exactly. I know somewhere about what things are likely to be, but there's no trimming and squaring my affairs, as Chloe trims crust off her pies. You don't know anything about business, I tell you." And Mr. Shelby, not knowing any other way of enforcing his ideas, raised his voice, a mode of arguing very convenient and convincing, when a gentleman is discussing matters of business with his wife. Mrs. Shelby ceased talking, with something of a sigh. The fact was that, though her husband had stated she was a woman, she had a clear, energetic, practical mind, and a force of character every way superior to that of her husband, so that it would not have been so very absurd a supposition to have allowed her capable of managing, as Mr. Shelby supposed. Her heart was set on performing her promise to Tom and Aunt Chloe, and she sighed as discouragements thickened around her. Don't you think we might in some way contrive to raise that money? Poor Aunt Chloe, her heart is so set on it." "'I'm sorry if it is. I think I was premature in promising. I'm not sure, now, but it's the best way to tell Chloe, and let her make up her mind to it. Tom'll have another wife, in a year or two, and she had better take up with somebody else." "'Mr. Shelby, I have taught my people that their marriages are as sacred as ours. I never could think of giving Chloe such advice." "'It's a pity, wife, that you have burdened them with a morality above their condition and prospects. I always thought so." "'It's only morality of the Bible, Mr. Shelby.' "'Well, well, Emily, I don't pretend to interfere with your religious notions. Only they seem extremely unfitted for people in that condition.' "'They are, indeed,' said Mrs. Shelby and that is why, from my soul, I hate the whole thing. I tell you, my dear, I cannot absolve myself from the promises I make to these helpless creatures. If I can get the money, no other way I will take music scholars. I could get enough, I know, and earn the money myself." "'You wouldn't degrade yourself that way, Emily. I never could consent to it. Degrade! Would it degrade me as much as to break my faith with the helpless? No, indeed. "'Well, you are always heroic and transcendental,' said Mr. Shelby. "'But I think you had better think before you undertake such a piece of quixotism.' Here the conversation was interrupted by the appearance of Aunt Chloe at the end of the veranda. "'If you please, missus,' said she. "'Well, Chloe, what is it?' said her mistress, rising and going to the end of the balcony. "'If missus would come and look at this yer a lot of poetry.' Chloe had a particular fancy for calling poultry poetry, 
an application of language in which she always persisted, notwithstanding frequent corrections and advisings from the young members of the family. "'Law sakes!' she would say. "'I can't see. One just good as Turi. Poetry's southern good, anyhow.' And so poetry, Chloe continued to call it. Mrs. Shelby smiled as she saw a prostrate lot of chickens and ducks over which Chloe stood, with a very grave face of consideration. "'I'm a-thinkin' whether Mrs. would be a-havin' a chicken pie o' these here. "'Really, Aunt Chloe, I don't much care. Serve them any way you like.' Chloe stood, handling them over abstractedly. It was quite evident that the chickens were not what she was thinking of. At last, with a short laugh with which her tribe often introduced a doubtful proposal, she said, "'Laws, Mrs. What should Massa and Mrs. be a troublin' theirselves bout the money, and not a usin' what's right in their hands?' And Chloe laughed again. "'I don't understand you, Chloe,' said Mrs. Shelby, nothing doubting, from her knowledge of Chloe's manner, that she had heard every word of the conversation that had passed between her and her husband. "'Why, laws me, Mrs.' said Chloe, laughing again. "'Other folks hires out their niggers and makes money on them. Don't keep such a tribe eating them out of house and home. Well, Chloe, who do you propose that we should hire out?' "'Laws, I ain't proposing nothing. Only Sam said there was one of these there perfectioners, they call em in Louisville, said he wanted a good hand at cake and pastry, and said he'd give em four dollars a week to one he did.' "'Well, Chloe?' "'Well, laws, I was a-thinkin', Missus, it's time Sally was put along to be doin' something. Sally's been under my care now dis some time, and she does most as well as me, considerin', and if Missus would only let me go, I would help fetch up de money. I ain't feared to put my cake nor pies nother, longside no perfectioners.' "'Confectioners, Chloe. Law sakes, Missus, tan't no odds. Words is so curious. Can't never get em right. "'But, Chloe, do you want to leave your children?' "'Laws, Mrs. Du Bois is big enough to do day's work. They do well enough, and Sally, she'll take the baby. She's such a pert young un, she won't take no lookin' at her. Louisville is a good way off. Law sakes, who's afeard? It's down river. Some near my old man, perhaps,' said Chloe, speaking the last in the tone of a question, and looking at Mrs. Shelby. "'No, Chloe, it's—' many a hundred miles off," said Mrs. Shelby. Chloe's countenance fell. "'Never mind. Your going there shall bring you nearer, Chloe. Yes, you may go, and your wages shall every cent of them be laid aside for your husband's redemption." As when a bright sunbeam turns a dark cloud to silver, so Chloe's dark face brightened immediately. It really shone. "'Laws! If Mrs. isn't too good! I was thinking that our very thing! "'Cause I shouldn't need no clothes, nor shoes, nor nothing. I could save every cent. How many weeks is there in a year, Missus? Fifty-two, said Mrs. Shelby. "'Laws, now, dear is, and four dollars for each on em. Why, how much dat I be? Two hundred and eight dollars,' said Mrs. Shelby. "'Why,' said Chloe, with an accent of surprise and delight, "'and how long would it take me to work it out, Missus?' some four or five years chloe but then you needn't do it all i shall add something to it i wouldn't hear to missus givin lessons nor nothin massa's quite right in dat ar twouldn't do no ways i hope none our family ever be brought to dat ar while i's got hands don't fear chloe i'll take care of the honor of the family said mrs shelby smiling but when do you expect to go well i want spect nothin only Sam, he's gwine to de river with some colts, and he said I could go along with him. So I just put my things together. Uh, if Missus was willin', I'd go with Sam tomorrow morning. If Missus would write my pass and write me a commendation, well, Chloe, I'll attend to it. If Mister Shelby has no objections, I must speak to him. Missus Shelby went upstairs, and Aunt Chloe, delighted, went out to her cabin to make her preparation. Law sakes, Massa George, ye didn't know I was gwine to Louisville tomorrow," she said to George, as entering her cabin he found her busy in sorting over her baby's clothes. I thought I'd just look over Sis's things and get em straightened up, but I'm gwine, Massa George, gwine to have four dollars a week, 
and Mrs. Gwine lay it all up to buy back my old man again. Phew, said George, here's a stroke of business, to be sure. How are you going? Tomorrow with Sam. And now, Master George, I knows you'll just sit down and write to my old man and tell him all about it, won't you? To be sure, said George. Uncle Tom will be right glad to hear from us. I'll go right in the house for paper and ink. And then, you know, Aunt Chloe, I can tell about the new colts and all. Sartin, sartin, Master George. You go long, and I'll get ye up a bit of chicken or some sich. You won't have many more suppers with your poor old auntie. End of chapter 21